We can count the rings of Saturn. We know that there are seven major ring groups with thousands of smaller rings within. We can cure gene defects before the child is even born. We understand the mechanisms by which hundreds of liters of water defy gravity and reach the crowns of the tallest trees in the world, the sequoia trees, over a hundred meters tall. Science is thriving. But what has made science progress so rapidly? Is it our ability to make better observations? Is it the improvements in the methods of experimentation? Or is it the quality of our logical thinking? Undoubtedly, all of these things are important. But could anything be missing? How about doubt? One of the most interesting things for me to do in school, and also what we are encouraged to do, is to look at every major idea from various perspectives. We analyze the strengths and the limitations of those ideas in aspects like the causes of a war, solutions to an ecological problem, or when solving a complex mathematical problem. We see the value of questioning ideas in all subjects, and science is no exception. Yes, science does benefit from such drivers as observation, experimentation, reason, but it also largely benefits from doubt. Karl Popper, a 20th century Austrian-British philosopher of science, promoted the idea of falsification. Popper argued that science makes the most progress when it looks for evidence against prevailing theories, not for them. Popper said, if we are uncritical, we shall always find what we want. We shall look for and find confirmations, and we shall look away from and not see whatever might be dangerous to our theories. Today, the theory of evolution is generally accepted. But in the spirit of Popper's idea of falsification, we all stand to benefit from every major idea, from questioning every major idea of every major idea or belief, including some aspects of the theory of evolution. The goal of doing this type of critical thinking is to keep the good parts of the model, but to improve the parts that don't hold up after careful examination. The foundation for the theory of evolution is the belief that life came about through abiogenesis. Abiogenesis is just a fancy way of saying that life spontaneously came from non-living matter. But according to another generally accepted biological theory, the cell theory, all living cells come from pre-existent living cells. So how can both of these theories, that life can come from non-life, that life only ever comes from life, how can both of these theories be true? Well, according to a distinguished French, French chemist, Louis Pasteur, in his experimental evidence, spontaneous generation of life from non-living matter is impossible. He said, all life comes from pre-existent life. So think about this. Where did you come from? Well, you had parents, right? Think. You had a mother. And she, where did she come from? Well, she too, she also had a mother, and so on. And the same is true for all animals, even simple one-celled organisms like bacteria. But what about plants? Well, a tree comes from the seed of another older living tree. So it has been observed over and over again by all of us that life comes from life. But has life ever been observed to come from something non-living? So far, no. It is true, however, that in the 1950s, Harold Urey and Stanley Miller came together and decided that they wanted to prove abiogenesis possible. So what they did was that they simulated Earth's early atmosphere using various gases, then they discharged electric current into those gases, and boom, they created amino acids. Now, what are amino acids? Well, they're organic compounds. And many people, when they hear the word organic, they think, life. But the question to ask is, does organic really mean alive? Take, for example, this blouse that I'm wearing now. The cloth that it's made out of, that's organic. Would you say, it's alive? Or wood? Everybody agrees, wood, that's organic. Is it alive? The fact is that actual life, complex cells with, with genetic information that could divide billions of times to create real, living organisms, 
has never been observed to come from something non-living. And here is a genuine reason for doubt. Another aspect of the theory of evolution that gets to, that's good to think about is the difference between microevolution and macroevolution. Microevolution is the minor evolutionary transition that occurs within one species of organism. So in the species of Canis lupus familiaris, or what we all know as dog, microevolution is the transition from a wild wolf to domestic poodle. That is my dog. <laughs> Macroevolution, on the other hand, is the major evolutionary transition from one species to a whole different type of species. So it's the belief that through natural selection, over an extremely long period of time, a reptile can become a bird. Microevolution has been observed. We can see it all around us. There are different types of cats, dogs, birds, etc. Macroevolution, however, has not been observed. Some evolutionary scientists would say that, yes, it is impossible to observe macroevolution because it happens over such a long period of time, no one person can observe it. Wolf Eckenhard Lönig, an evolutionary scientist of the Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding Research in Germany, conducted an experiment where he and other scientists believed that if they selected favorable mutations, they could create better versions of plants and animals, and maybe even whole new species altogether. So in other words, what they were trying to do was speed up macroevolution. After 30 years of continuous research, all the mutants died or were weaker than their wild varieties. Luna concluded, Mutations cannot transform an original species of plant or animal into an entirely new one. They can't. He continues, This conclusion agrees with all the experiences and results of mutation research of the 20th century taken together, as well as with the laws of probability. Pasteur and Lönig, along with other scientists, have made detailed observations, have done high-quality experiments, and have applied the laws of logic to interpret the data. In addition to observation, experimentation, reason, science progresses best when doubt is in play. In today's 21st century education, perhaps the most valuable skill we can all learn is how to become good questioners of evidence, open-minded enough to accept that our initial ideas may be wrong. Doubt is not our enemy. Doubting traditions, doubting assumptions, doubting mainstream ideas or beliefs is the key to high-quality critical thinking and to the ongoing and noble search for truth. Thank you.